Greetings. The Lord is with you. And I'm Pastor Bob Quaintance uh, from Good Hope Lutheran Church in Youngstown, Ohio. And I'm pleased to be with you tonight as we continue in our reading through the New Testament, one chapter a day, five days a week. Today we are nearing the end of 1 Corinthians. We are in chapter 15. Um, we uh, begin today, as we always do, by making the sign of the cross and remembering that we and, and saying together, we are under the care of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. How could you lose with that? Um, and uh, we'll uh, begin with an opening prayer. Lord, the centrality of the death and resurrection of Christ. We preach Christ crucified and risen. And this is the center of our faith. It shapes all that we believe. Lord, let this word today in 1 Corinthians continue to deepen and shape our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, thank you for joining me. Good evening, Mark and everyone else on. Um, we are in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, tomorrow evening, my schedule will be full. Um, I have um, a, a council meeting at 6 to uh, eight and from eight to nine, a stop the bleed class, and um, uh, so I'm going to either be posting really late or have to post early, and I'll try and make it a short post tomorrow. Chapter sixteen is a chapter about uh, the offering for the poor in Jerusalem that Paul is collecting, and he has just a word about. Um, uh, our offerings that I think is a valuable word for us to hear. And then some final greetings and final instructions as he's uh, fi finishing this letter to the Corinthians. There will, of course, be more to come. Uh, but today we are in chapter 15 and the resurrection. Good evening, Mark, and good evening, Jill and Fred. Uh, good to see you and others on as well. So here we are, verse 1, chapter 15. Uh, and this is the heart of the message. He began in chapter 1 by talking about Christ and him crucified. Well, the other side of him crucified is that Christ is risen. And being risen makes all the difference for us. His death for our salvation, his resurrection, his victory over death, and the assurance that our sins have been paid for. Well, we hear about the centrality of the resurrection and about our rising from the dead here in chapter 15. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Um, so a word, the center of the gospel that Paul preached is Christ crucified and risen. And you need to continue to stand as that, with that as the foundation of all teaching. Um, verse 3, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, a euphemistic phrase for having died. Then, verse 7, he appeared to James, to, all the, to, to James, then all the apostles. And last of all, verse 8, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Uh, he'll go on talking about himself there for a moment, but but of first importance, uh, the gospel message, the early kerygma of the church, the early preaching of the church, that Jesus died for our sins, he was buried, he was raised on the third day, and he appeared to the apostles who became witnesses of the resurrection, and then he appeared to more than 500 people at one time, along with other appearances, my goodness. And last of all, while Paul was on the road to Damascus, Jesus appeared to him, risen, and he knew that Jesus wasn't dead. 
for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me has, was not in vain. Out of grace, God came and saved this persecutor of the church. And Paul has never forgotten. And this gift of salvation has not been a poor investment by God. It has transformed Paul's life. And he has lived completely for the, for the Christ who had died for his sins and was raised from the dead and appeared to him alive on the road to Damascus. His grace toward me, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Uh, not by his own doing, he gets no credit, but it is God's grace. Good evening, Shirley. I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is in me or with me. Whether then it was I or they, Paul, Apollos, Peter, whomever. Remember chapter one. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach Christ crucified and risen and appearing. So we preach and you, so you believed. Now regarding the resurrection of Christ, the center of our faith. Verse 12, Paul is addressing questions, remember, in this letter that have been sent to him. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, uh, the, the believers who've died and fallen asleep, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. What, didn't he die on the cross for our sins? Yes. But we wouldn't have known that. His death would have been just one more death of would-be prophets. Remember the two on the road to Emmaus? The death of Jesus didn't do anything for them. We had hoped that he was the one um, that was to redeem Israel. They had hoped, but they'd given up hope now because he had died. It wasn't until the resurrection and he appeared to them in the breaking of the bread that their lives were transformed. <coughs> if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. For we have we are even found to be we are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified about God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise. If it is true that the dead are not raised, you say the dead are not raised. Jesus was the dead are not raised. Jesus was raised. Don't you tell me the dead aren't raised? And remember, God is the God of the living, not the dead. <clears throat> For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Paul's really picking on this. There are some people he's been made, made aware of in the letter that are saying there's no resurrection of the dead. Wait a minute, Paul said. That would go to the very core foundational principle, spiritual truth of the Christian church. He died, was buried, and on the third day rose again, and he appeared to countless people. Well, many people, including 500 at one time, and Paul is the last. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hoped in this life only, we, we are of all people most to be pitied. Should have been going, going and eat, drink, and be merry. Sleep around, uh, stab your neighbor in the back, live however you want. If Jesus hasn't been raised, then it doesn't make a difference. You're all going to die, and that's the end of everything. But if Christ is raised from the dead, changes everything. Verse 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who are fallen asleep. The resurrection of Jesus is one of the best attested facts of human history. Uh, 
we we see the twelve the the disciples, the twelve including Paul, who are willing to die for what they believe to be true. They weren't willing to die for a lie. No one is. People die for things they sincerely believe, but they don't die for what they believe to be untrue. No, they'll find a way to get out of dying if possible. But they willingly went to their deaths, except for John, who was, uh, died an old man after his exile on Patmos. Um, they, they all were willing to die for what they believed and knew to be true. They had seen the risen Christ. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Not only did he rise from the dead, but he is the first of everyone, and he'll bring the rest along. He's like the apple tree and the first ripe fruit, more to follow. For as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. By a man, Adam, came death. By a man, Jesus, has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. We're connected to Adam by birth. We are connected to Jesus by rebirth. Um, I believe the scriptures are clear that that's in baptism and faith. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. So the correct order, Christ first, at his coming, those who belong to Christ, and then uh, comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he expected, he accepted who, he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him, the Father. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him, the Father, who put all things in subjection under his feet, that God may be God, may be all in all. Otherwise, and here's a strange passage. Otherwise, why do people, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? We had this discussion about husbands and wives and husband being saved uh, through their believing wife, but not quite. A little confusing piece earlier in 1 Corinthians. Well, this, this verse uh, just about tops them uh, in terms of confusing. Um, I've never heard of a Christian practice in any denomination of people being baptized on behalf of the dead. There might be something in the Mormon church, but they're not Christians. Uh, they're a sect, a non-Christian uh, religion. Um, they, they use some things of the Bible, but they use more of the Book of Mormon. We have only the scriptures, and there is nothing in any Christian tradition that I know of, of being baptized uh, on behalf of the dead so that then they could be saved. So whatever this practice is, I'm not sure what it is. Why do pe what, do, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why, do people, why are people baptized on their behalf? Perhaps there was some practice like that. I don't know. And that's what I want to say. I don't know. Um, I, I said this on Sunday in a class. Now, I do not know everything about the Bible. Far from it. Uh, when I don't know, I'll be pretty clear about that. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, now we know only in part. Then we shall know fully. Now we see in a mirror dimly. Then we shall see face to face. Well, right now, I'm pretty dim on this one. And I do not know. Um. But I do understand what he goes on to say. So I don't understand 24, or verse 29. Okay, I'll go on uh, to verse 30. I understand it. Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? Lions? Uh, another, we're not quite sure 
what the reference is to uh, that, that Paul is speaking of. But he fought with beasts in Ephesus. If, why, did, why did I fight with beasts if, if uh, the dead are not raised? Let us eat and drink and tomorrow we die. Yeah, let's party. Um, if there is no resurrection, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Some Christians are living like, let's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. But no, there is a judgment, and we preached on that on Sunday. Um, I invite you to, if you didn't catch the service on Sunday, uh, to go on our website or our YouTube channel and, and listen to it. Um, there is a judgment. And uh, there will be a day of accounting. Um, and there will be a resurrection to life everlasting or to eternal punishment. Well, that there is a resurrection of Christ, he's done with that. That it causes us to be sure of our resurrection. And that gives us hope to endure all suffering. Um, we're done with that. Now, he's talking about, well, how will we be raised? What will, what will our body be like? People ask that. People sometimes say when someone has died that now they're an angel in heaven. They aren't an angel. Uh, and angels are angels. Humans are humans. They're two different species of being. We don't change into a different species. We may be like a butterfly that at one stage is like a caterpillar, and then we turn into a butterfly, but we don't turn into a cat or a dog or a horse. Um, no. Um, uh, that thought... Cut that out of your brain. And nothing in the Bible says that. Contrary, listen to what Paul says. Someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. Uh, thinking now about everything in the world, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. You bury it in the ground, it dies, and then it comes to life. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. Our grandchildren had the joy this year of helping to plant corn. And now they have the real joy. Uh, they've been watching the corn growing, and now we are eating at our table the corn that Walter and uh, uh, um, Alex have planted, a bare kernel, but grows up into a stock, and we eat three heads of corn off of every stock that they planted. It is, um, what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain, like sweet corn. But God gives it a body as he has chosen to each kind of seed its own body. For, you know, there's, for, for not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans and another for animals, another for birds and another for fish. And there are heavenly bodies. Oh, there comes that angel thing. And earthly bodies. Where are the earthly bodies? But the glory of the heavenly is of one kind. The glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory for the sun and another for the moon and another glory of the stars. For stars differ from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is is imperishable. This is God's miraculous work. We die and we are buried. Whether we're cremated or embalmed, it is eventually dust to dust. We are, what is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. God's miraculous work. The work of the resurrection power. It is sown in dishonor, a dead body. It is raised in glory, shining like, like Jesus. It is sown in weakness, in death. It is raised in power, the resurrection victory. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a supernatural body. Doesn't become, the human body doesn't become an angelic body, a spiritual body. No, it remains a human body, but it's now sown like a kernel of corn. And it comes up as corn, but a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. 
the last Adam, Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the natural that is the first, excuse me, it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And is and as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Jesus' body was different. It was a human body. It was Jesus' body. He could eat. They could touch his na- the nail prints in his hands and this place where the spear pierced his side. It was a real body, but it was a spiritual, a raised body, and not even yet completely raised, as he told the disciples. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers, brothers and sisters, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. We need to be buried. Um, We need to turn to dust. (laughs) Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Uh, Not everyone will die before Christ comes. There will be people alive, Christians alive, when Jesus comes. That's the hope. Wouldn't it be wonderful to see that? Wow. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we who are alive will be changed. In that moment, we won't go to dust. We'll just go to our heavenly body on the day he comes. We shall be changed, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable, And this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of of sin is the law. The sting, sin, that brings death. Uh, The serpent uh, causes that. Uh, The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, on this topic of the resurrection and everything else Paul has said. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. End of chapter 15. Well, tomorrow I will post uh, briefly on chapter 16, and I probably won't be done at the church till after 9 o'clock. So uh, God bless you. Uh, Thank you for joining me. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the truth of the resurrection and the clarity about what happens with our bodies. And how anytime we hear people saying we can, uh, they've gone to heaven to be an angel, we, we can, well, there are times to keep our mouth shut, Lord. But there might be times of teaching where we can say, no, angels are of a different kind of nature than humans. But we will be raised, and we'll be raised with an imperishable body. We will be like Christ. Thank you for this hope, Lord, that when he comes again, we will all be changed and raised and We will be and our bodies will be raised and we'll be together with the Lord forever. Thank you for the foundational truths of the resurrection of Christ so that we might know, Lord, that our life has meaning beyond just eat, drink, and be merry and do whatever you want to whomever you want. Enjoy life just hedonistically for yourself because this life is all there is. No, we do not believe that because of the resurrection of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for that gift in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me. Remember always, God loves you, and so do I. Bye-bye.